This video is a part one of a two-part series on how to entertain children of all ages, so stay tuned. Hey sitters, welcome back to another video. It is Lydia, thanks for joining me. And in today's video, we're going to talk entertaining children of all ages. I've had a lot of questions of how to entertain different ages. I've had a lot of questions on how to entertain multiple ages at the same time. Um, I've had questions on how to entertain groups of different aged kids. Um, so today I wanted to go over games that can be played by all ages. And when I say all ages, I mean one to 13. Under one, you have to entertain them in a different way. Um, and a, and a groups of different sizes. So you could play these with two or you could play these with eight people. Um, so we're gonna dive in. However, this part one is going to be everything indoors. These are all indoor games that you can play with the kids. Just in case you, the parents can't, don't want you to be outside with the kids. If it's raining outside here in Florida, we are headed into rainy season. If it's too cold outside, we don't have that problem here. Um, or if they live in an apartment complex and there is no place to get out and do outside activities. So all indoor activities, all ages, all kind of group sizes. Let's dive in. Alrighty, the first game I have here is scavenger hunts. So I have Easter eggs here. Yes, Easter is coming up, but I use these all year round. They're very useful. You need to use what you have, reuse, recycle, um, use the resources you have. I tell you guys that all the time. So Easter eggs are great. They're colorful. They're just the right size. They're a great thing to hide for younger ages. These can be hidden in so many spots, but they're also colorful. So let's talk different scenarios, right? Let's say we have two two-year-olds. I hide only about five to eight eggs in the house with the two two-year-olds. I only hide this many eggs because if you're hiding too many eggs, you lose engagement. They don't care about it. It's not exciting anymore. They're, they've been looking for 30 minutes. They're just not having fun. You're losing them. You've got to make it fun and engaging for them. So I hide five to eight eggs, different colors, in easy spots. And because there are two, we like to play the hot and cold game as well. So as they're getting closer to these eggs, I let them know, oh, you're getting warmer, you're getting warmer, or oh, you're getting colder, you're getting colder, let's not, that's, it's not over there, so that I'm engaging with them while they're playing this game. Um, once they're all found, either A, you could ha help one of the two-year-olds hide the eggs, it's their turn, or you just hide them in brand new spots. Really, the kids will tell you what they want. Um, so that's for two two-year-olds, right? Let's talk about if we have a two-year-old and a nine-year-old. I make sure that they're color coordinated if I'm working with two different age groups. That way I can hot, so I have yellow here and I have a dark blue, right? So for my older one, I could say, um, I could say that theirs is dark blue. Yours is dark blue. If you find any yellows, don't touch them. Don't tell them where they are you move on. Um, so I hide theirs in, in higher places. I hide them in ha um, harder spots. I make it a little more difficult for them because their engagement is longer, right? They are, their attention span is longer than two-year-olds. So I will hide these a little bit harder. And then for my two-year-old, I will hide the yellow one and I will play the hot and cold game with them so that there, there is a fair and even playing field. Whoever finds all their eggs first then gets to hide for the second round, right? So that's another way you can play with them. Let's say you have a group of six kids. I hide one egg and that's it. One egg, I try to hide in an easy spot because if I'm working with a two-year-old, you wanna, you wanna, um, what's the word? You wanna cater to them because they're the youngest and they're going to need the most help. So you. You hide it in a good spot. Again, we play the hot and cold game for everybody at this point. And then whoever finds the egg first gets to hide it this, the next round. Um, and that's really engaging for them as well. The rounds can go very quick, or if you hide it in a difficult spot for older age kids, 
it could be a little bit of a longer game. So there are, some different, there are a couple different ways you could play this. If you don't have Easter eggs, you find something that is bright and colorful. It's, it stands out. It's easy to find um, and easy to hide. So, um, but try and use what you have. I mean, Easter eggs, you buy them once a year, but they're good for so many things. So use them. So treasure hunt, that's the first indoor game we like to play. The second game we play is hide and seek. Personally, not my favorite game. However, easy for a big group of kids. Um, if I'm working with a big group of kids and they want to play hide and go seek, I will help the youngest out if they need help. If they don't, I let them play their game. They're, they know how to play. There's no, there no, needs to be no referee, I guess you'd say. So I just monitor and make sure that nobody's getting in places that they may get stuck or they're getting into a dangerous spot that they shouldn't be in. Um, but if there is a younger kid, again, a two-year-old that's playing with a six, eight, nine-year-old, I will help him or her get into these spots or find a good hiding spot. Because you know those young ones like to hide under the carpet or behind a pillow, and that's not really fair. They, they need better hiding spots. So I'll help the young ones out and have the older ones count and find and then whoever's found last gets to be the one who counts the next round. So hide and seek's a great one. I personally don't like to play it, um, but I do, if it's a larger group and they wanna play it, I do help out. The next one is indoor bowling. So indoor bowling, you don't need bowling pins. Use your resources, people. Household items, right? Solo cups or plastic cups, regular cups. If you're going to do that, make sure that you're washing them and you are cleaning them because you don't want to put cups on the ground and put them back in the cabinet. However, solo cups, stack them into a, into a pyramid, right? And then find some sort of ball. You're in a house with kids. I'm sure there's a ball somewhere that they can roll down the hallway and into these cups. And then you count how many cups have fell over, how many cups are standing, count scores, keep scores, um, and then make it a, uh, a challenge against each other. What you can do for easier kids or um, for younger kids, you can stack them. So stacking them in a pyramid so that the base is a bigger base. I meant for the older kids, what you can do to make it a little more challenging is stacking them one on top of each other. So instead of having this big space for them, you have now a narrow space for them, for them to knock down things, which will be a little harder for them. You can also put things on different cups, right? So you spread out the cups a little and put things on top of the cups. If they knock over that certain cup, that's extra points because they had knocked over the special pin, right? So or indoor bowling is great. There's a lot of different ways you can do this. Um, and you can find the stuff in the house to use for it. So you don't have to bring anything in your babysitting bag. You can, but you don't have to. This next game also uses household items. So what you're going to need is some spoons, wooden spoons, paper plates, and masking tape, and a balloon. Typically, I bring the balloon and I bring the plates just to make sure, and the masking tape just to make sure I have it all. I just try to find the wooden spoons in the drawer, the kitchen drawers. Again, if you're going to be using their utensils or anything like that, make sure you're washing them and cleaning them after you're done using them before putting them back. Um, so balloon tennis is the game that we will create out of this. Um, a paper, you're gonna take a paper plate and a wooden spoon and tape it to it to make a tennis racket for the, the, the balloon. Um, so with this game, for the younger ones, we just hit it back and forth. It is very entertaining for them. Um, but for my older kids, I like to try and challenge them in different ways. So you, for your four, five-year-olds, you just ask to see how many times they can hit it in a row. For my seven, eight, nine-year-olds, I ask them to um, hit it and then spin around once or twice and hit it again see how many times they can do that before dropping it. Um, we hit it back and forth to see how many times we can hit it back and forth without dropping it. 
There's so many ways you can do this. Again, very versatile um, on how to play the play balloon tennis. Um, it's kind of like the game Don't Touch the Ground. If you ever played that when you were a child, we did. Um, but this makes it a little more fun because they have tennis rackets and there's challenges to it. So again, very simple household items that you can play or create to play a game. The next one is paper airplanes. So this one, you can make an entire event. You will shoot yourself in the foot if you have everybody make fold an airplane or you fold it for them, have everybody line up on the, the line and who, throw it at the same time and whoever goes farthest, farthest wins. You will shoot yourself in the foot. It's one throw, it's over. You may get three or four throws out of them, but then that's it, game over. Make it an event. When you start that, you're gonna say that you're gonna make paper airplanes, show them different ways on how to make the airplane, right? Don't give them, don't overwhelm them. I think there's multiple ways you could fold an airplane. Give them two or three. Have them pick which way they want their airplane folded. Then they decorate their airplane. Stickers, glitter, crayons, markers. They have to personalize their airplane, right? There's a craft right there within an event that you're doing, within a game you're doing. And then once that's done, you guys fly them. But again, not with everybody just lined up on one line. In sports, they have brackets, right? So you have two teams that play each other and two teams play each other. The winner of those two teams go and play each other and so on and so forth, right? Do the same, that's, you could do the same thing with them, right? And you're gonna make it an entire event so that everybody's engaged, you're not losing their attention and it is exciting. And then those, you're going to have sore losers, but those losers can then support their team, their whatever team they think's gonna win, right? and they can become a sponsor to those who have moved on. Make it an entire event. That's one way you can do it. Or you can have one person go at a time, get a tape measure out. Kids, for some reason, really love measuring their successes. We all do. Get a tape measure out. Have one person go at a time. You put a line down on the, the ground where they need to stand and measure out how far their airplane went. This can be done for somebody who, there is no other kids in a group. This can be done for one kid and he can beat his own time or his own score. So if you don't have a group that he can go against, have him challenge himself, have him see how far he can go. And then you're also there, you could play the game with him. But if you're not wanting to, which that's what you're hired to do, um, have him beat his, his flight, right? So paper airplane races, when I say it, it sounds really boring, but it's up to you to see how much you can creatively engage the children. The next activity you can do with the kiddos is board games. Now, I don't know why they're called board games because I'm never bored while playing with them. I'm just kidding. I do know it is because it's on a board. They're called board games. B-O-A-R-D versus B-O-R-E-D. It matters. Um, but apples to apples is the first one. We played this when we were younger. Our family loved this game. Um, we had a lot of kids in our neighborhood that would come over. And it was one of our go-to board games. Apples to apples, you have green cards and you have red cards. Green apples and red apples. And the green card had a description word on it. So this one's magical. And the... Um, the red apples are your cards that you have in your hand. So you would have, I don't remember, five or seven in your hand and you are able to go around and basically put what you think matches the description word face down with the, the card. You can look up how to play the game. It's a lot of fun, very good for all a big group but if you have younger kids who don't know how to read, you're going to have to help them. So what I do is I put the young ones on my team or I don't play at all and I help whoever needs help reading the cards. So, um, but 
If you're creative and if you have the time, you can do this. It'd take a lot of time, but you could do this with pictures if you wanted to. Um, and just make a picture version of the game so that younger ones can play without your help. So Apples to Apples was a great game that we played with a large group of kids, many different ages, who could all read at that time. Um, and it, it could last for as long as you want it to. So if you're interested, look it up and look at how to play because I'm sure you're familiar with it, but it's a great game. All right, the next board game is Candyland. I'm sure you've all come across it one time or another, especially when working with kids. Um, that one I love to put twists on. If a older kid draws a blue or a double blue, they've got to run around the table three times. Or uh, if they draw a red, that they get their turn skipped. I know there's skips in there, but we expand the specialty cards. Um, so keep it engaging, keeping it in, it interesting. Um, and then the last one is, uh, shoots and ladders. For some reason, all of my younger kids love that game. Um, it's just so much fun because you never know which one you're going to land on and it's exciting. There's it attention grabbing and it holds their attention. So those are my top three that I have found recently that I've been enjoying playing with the groups of kids. The next activity I really like to do with kids um, that I think is great for all ages is baking and cooking. And you can absolutely cater this to the kids' ages and the group size as well. Um, so for younger kids, I like to go towards more baking because there's not so much usage of knives in that. Um, and it's easier things for them to do, like mixing and stuff like that. However, baking and cooking teach kids a lot. They're learning measurements, they're learning body awareness, so when they are cutting, they're making sure that they're holding the food right. Um, when they're pouring, they're making sure that their hand is over the cup correctly. They are learning hygiene, so they're um, Making, we're making sure that our hands are clean and they're not touching things and then touching the food or they're not licking their fingers or licking a spoon and putting it back in. They're really learning and absorbing a lot when we are baking and cooking. So do I just throw in a pizza in the oven? That's not really what I'm looking to do. Instead, I'm looking to create the pizza with the kids, right? Making it personalized and making it their own we roll out the dough or we make the dough. Oh, they're also learning patience, right? We have to let the dough rise. We have to let the cupcakes cook in the oven. Um, so making that pizza, letting that dough rise and rolling it out to the perfect shape and size. We're putting sauce on it, cheese and pepperonis, and we cater it to what they are looking to make. And then it's great to eat afterwards, of course. Um, but let's talk about baking real quick. This pan can make all the letters in the alphabet. So this, oh. These sit correctly. If sat correctly, they can make letters, right? So that makes an E. So if you have a thing, if you've got an Emily or Easter's coming up, you can make the letter E. But with all these inserts, you can make every letter in the alphabet, and I'm pretty sure all the numbers too. So if it's somebody's third birthday, or if it's somebody's second birthday coming up, or ninth birthday, you have the inserts to make the letter, or the numbers as well. So I really like doing that um, because it's not just baking a cake and decorating it, it's actually shaping a cake and then decorating it. Um, so for Easter one year, we ended up making grass all over the E and putting little Easter eggs on it and making a bunny. Um, and it was a lot of fun to decorate a shaped cake. Um, and you don't have to be a master to, to cut the cape, cake in a certain shape. That does it for you. This pan I'll link down below in, a, in the description. Mine's Pamper Chef, but 
you can, um, I found one on Amazon that does the same thing. So, and you can look at videos on how to rearrange the little pieces in there to make different letters and numbers. Um, but I found that that's a lot of fun. And again, instead of just baking a, a sheet pan cake, um, you're creating letters and, and um, numbers. So that's a lot of fun. However, if a cake is too much and we're not doing cakes and we're doing cookies instead, I like to bring cookie cutter um, shapes, cutters, cookie cutters. Um, and I have seasonal cooking cu cookie cutters. I do, I did buy um, one year for something. I bought a themed one as well. And I keep them and I clean them and I keep them updated because I use them all year wrong, round, right? So for example, this is a light bulb for Christmas, right? This is a Christmas tree, gingerbread man, a heart for Valentine's Day. Again, use your resources, use what you have. So instead of this being a light bulb, it's now a fish, right? Or instead of this being a heart, what we do around Christmas time, so we flip it up upside down, put a little hat on it, put some rosy cheeks on it, a couple eyes, and it becomes Santa Claus. So you've got to get creative. You can also challenge the kiddos to um, get creative and give them, give them something and ask them to decorate it, not what it is meant for. So this is a shell. This is the themed one. Oh, that's a dime. That's a dragon. I have a mermaid in there somewhere, but this is a shell. What else can they create with it, right? Maybe they create a guy's face and then this is his curly hair on top or an afro on top. But for the older kids, it helps them get creative and it helps them think about things outside of the box, right? So yes, Christmas cookie cutter, but it could become a fish. We put a little fish hook in its mouth and it, it can be very cute. So I like doing that as well. Again, making the cookies, baking them, but not only stopping there, decorating them. Like go a step further and get creative with this. Um, I also like to, to, like I said earlier, cook things with the kids. So if they're old enough, I try to involve them in cooking dinner as well. And we get creative with that. Um, and then also the little kids like to help set the table. Don't forget about those details that little kids can help with. Setting the tables very easily, easy. Putting the plates out, silverware, um, cups, empty cups at the table, like get them involved as well. If they can't do the cutting or the, the stuff near the oven or the stove, get them to do something else that's inclusive into what you're doing. And then I have these little gems. They are educational individual games for children to play. Um, and I have created these and put these on Etsy. That's where you can find them. I'll put a link down in the description below so you can go check them out. But if you're going to bring these or use these, make sure that you have one game or an activity for um, each child, but also making sure that the game matches their educational ability. Um, so we have telling time, there's um, shape matching, there's color matching for the younger, younger crowd, there's alphabet um, letter recognition. There's a lot over there. There's contractions, there's rhyming. Um, there's so much over there that you can go check out, but there is enough over there for each age group. Um, so if you want to do those, the, that'd be a great um, activity for indoors as well. Now, if worse comes to worse and you don't have any of this stuff, which I would be very, very surprised if you don't have any of this stuff, um, because they're all household items, I'm sure the people you're going to work with have some of this stuff. You can always play imagination games, um, things that get older kids thinking, or I say older, but a lot of the kids can do this. Um, for example, when I was working with two two-year-olds, I would 
sit at like a table, like I was sitting at a table and I had two waiters, right? Both two two two-year-olds. They would come up to me. Oh, they were, we were grocery shopping. That's what we were doing. And I said, hi, I need you to grab me asparagus from the grocery store. And before she would leave, I would also say, and I need you to grab me apples from the grocery store. And they would run around the house and do a couple things and then come back to me. And I would say, thank you. What did you grab me from the grocery store? And she would have to remember that she, I told her to grab asparagus. And I told him to grab me what I asked for him. So it's a kind of a memory game, but it's also very fun for them, right? Create an obstacle course that they have to go through to get to the grocery store, right? We always talk about um, we cross the river and over the bridge and up the hill, right? Create those rivers and bridges and hills that they have to go and climb over or climb through to get to the grocery store. Because while they're doing that, they're still trying to remember or memorize what you asked them to grab you. If you've got an older kid and a younger kid, let's say they're nine and two, uh, I don't know why I keep using those ages, but that's what the biggest age gap I think I've worked with. So he's nine. You can ask him to be a waiter at a restaurant, right? Here's what I'd like to order and make it complicated sometimes. I like a burger, no cheese, add grilled onions, hold the lettuce and tomato, but I'll have some pickles, right? Have him go and cook it again. Do Have him do an activity and then have him come back and say, okay, well, here's your burger. I held the lettuce and the tomato for you, but there's grilled onions. There's no cheese. Here's some pickles, right? Get them thinking. Give them something to phys, not physically, but something that they have to remember, right? You don't want to make it boring. You don't want to be like, oh, I'll have a glass of milk, right? Keep it engaging, keep it entertaining, keep it difficult because the kids can do it. So imagination games are great um, as well. I don't like to ma imagine playing babies like that kind of imagination play. I'm not into, let me clarify. Baby dolls I'll play with all day long with the kids, right? If they don't dictate how I play, I don't like that. But I will not play imagination babies. If there's no physical doll there and I have to pretend I have a baby in my hand, I'm not for it. Alrighty, let me know down in the comment section below if you have used, if you found yourself using household items to create activities to play around the house. If so, let me know how as well. I'm always looking for different ways to reuse, recycle, come up with things. Obviously, you can always do crafts with kids inside, but I want some of my kids want new things to do, new activities to do. So I can't keep doing the same thing over and over again. And some of my kids are not craft kids, okay? You, some kids are just not craft kids. They don't want to sit down. They don't want to color. They don't want to glue something, you know? So let me know if you found yourself doing any activities inside that is not so much craft activities but more so game activities. And let me know, like details. I wanna know so I can do it with my kiddos as well. Stay tuned next week for part two. We'll talk about things we can do with kids outside. That is for big groups for all ages as well. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video.